time I introduced uh, for an arbitrary variety, projective variety like this, non-degenerate, not contained in a hyperplane, uh, I considered the filtration, ascending filtration by thickened variety, uh, formed by codes of the variety, the second thickened variety, formed by, uh, covered by uh, planes spanned by uh, three general points of variety and so on. And finally, at the step K1, we get the ambient space. Uh, and uh, in our basic example, when X is the Segre variety, uh, this corresponds to matrices of rank 1, of matrices, uh, this corresponds to matrices of rank at most 2, and so on. And this to the space of matrices. And a different notation with joins, uh, it's called X2, se second self-join, X3, and so on. And now uh, we denote it by SK, the dimension of this second variety. And we introduced uh, the second defect. The case second defect is defined as follows. Uh, and the meaning of this is very easy. If we have uh, this preceding second variety uh, and we join its point with the points of X, then the expected dimension is obtained like this, like, uh, sorry, like uh, SK minus uh, 1, uh, 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 the expected dimension is like this, because you join uh, a general point of this, has, which has dimension this, with a general point of X, which has dimension N, and so the expected dimension is this, and uh, your dimension can be less than it cannot be more than this, but it can be less than this, and so we call this uh, difference uh, delta k. Uh, and now I'll uh, give you another uh, geometric description uh, of this delta. Uh, last time I explained to you that uh, it can be defined as the dimension of the entry locus. Uh, uh, so, we take a general point in this second variety. General means that uh, it's outside of some uh, closed sub-variety of smaller dimensions. And then we consider uh, all pictures like this. This point U lines on a line by this definition, uh, by this definition, you join points of X with points of SK minus 1 of X. And so, you have this picture, and here is a point of X. And uh, this is possible for different V and different X. And the locus of all such X is called the entry locus. So that, for example, for a second variety, if you have something like a conic on the plane, you take a point U, then the entry locus is composed of this conic. And uh, uh, we have uh, uh, the interpretation of deficiency as the dimension of the center locus. And now I'll uh, give you a result which uh, gives a geometric meaning to these uh, deficiencies. So, uh, the following is called Terracini Lemma. Terracini is an, was an Italian mathematician of the 20th century. And uh, it can be formulated for arbitrary two varieties, for the join uh, of arbitrary two varieties, X and Y. So I denote uh, by this its join, or you can alternatively denote it by this. 
This means that uh, you consider the variety swept up, swept up by all secant lines joining point of x with points of y. For example, if y is one point, then you get a cone. This is clear. And so uh, we consider this variety and we are interested in the tangent space to this variety, to this join, in some point z. So we consider a point z here, or you can write it in a different order, this doesn't make any change. Uh, and you are interested in this tangent space. And suppose that z uh, is contained in a line joining some point x with some point of y. So this one in x and this one is y capital. So we consider a particular line uh, where x is not equal to y. And so Traccini uh, uh, lemma says that this tangent space al always contains the two tangent space to these two varieties in the corresponding points. And this is the first statement. And the second statement is that if z is general, again except for some points in some close variety of small dimension, then you have a quality. And these angular uh, brackets always denote the linear space spanned by these two linear subspaces. Uh, so, uh, and this holds for any line joining point x with, uh, jo uh, on which uh, uh, z lies. So, if there are many such lines, then uh, you have many representations like this. In, in, in the number one, g is uh, uh, belong to the line is assumption, right? Yes, yeah. yes. This is assumption. Yeah. And this is a statement. Statement is here. So, and I'll prove this lemma because the proof is really very, very easy. Uh, maybe it's e is to make it still more easy, it's better to pass to vector spaces. You know that each projective space corresponds to a vector space of dimension one more, and then each variety x uh, corresponds to the cone with vertex at the origin over this variety. So we have, instead of two varieties, x and y, we have cones of dimension uh, one more over these varieties. Uh, and this may be m, where uh, the dimension here is n and m. And now, uh, what do you think corresponds to the variety uh, join, to the join variety? Who can tell me? So. Uh, again, it will be some coin, some corn over what? So, corn over join. Or second variety, uh, we write it in different ways. So, who can tell me what corresponds to the join? Some, yes, yes. So, if, uh, look, if we have a line here on one corn and a line uh, on the other corn, then, uh, for the points, the corresponding points in the projective space, we should join them by a line. And if we pass to uh, these coordinates where we have one more coordinate and consider uh, all linear combinations, then we get this line. And all linear combination uh, is just the sum because we can take this point, this point, and then we obtain the sum. So, we can write it mm, as kx plus ky. So this is a very, very simple formula. Uh, and now, uh, of course, we have uh, a map 
of the product of these two cones here. And this map is just summation, addition map. Uh, and this map, as we saw, it's subjective. Uh, and now uh, there is, uh, it's a general statement that uh, uh, the differential of, of this map is just again summation, because it's a linear map. So if we call this map, uh, I, I don't know, sigma, because it's summation, then the sigma is actually a uh, summation map also. And we have a subjective map of this variety onto this variety. And, uh, of course, the image of the differential always is contained in the tangent space to the image. And this is the first statement. Because this tangent space uh, and this uh, the image of the differential, uh, so the first statement is proved. And then it's uh, uh, a statement, well-known statement, of generic smoothness that if you have a morphism like this, like this uh, morphism uh, which I denoted sigma, uh, then if we take uh, a general point, uh, then, uh, it, or a general point here even, then the differential is subjective, because the image is this, uh, this variety. So this gives us uh, the second statement. Generic smoothness. Or in differential geometry it's called submersivity. So it's a very uh, cheap lemma, but this allows us to interpret this secant locus. Uh, and we get the following statement, corollary. We take uh, this second variety, of course k is less than k1, because we want it to be distinct from the ambient space, and take a general point here, general point. And since this, it's not an ambient space, the ambient space, then we can consider the tangent space. It's a linear space, because the point is uh, general, it's a linear space of dimension SK. And the Terracini lemma says that this linear space contains linear spaces to X for all X in the entry locus. Because by definition, uh, all uh, points of this entry locus, they lie on some line joining a point of X with some point of SK minus 1. And then, uh, if you uh, re replace here uh, Y by SK minus 1, then you immediately get this statement. And therefore, of course, every hyperplane which is, uh, contains this linear space is also tangent uh, to uh, x along uh, this entry locus. So, if we denote by uh, this a union of all these tangent spaces, Uh, then we see that uh, we can write it like this. And now uh, this is uh, uh, this is a positive. Di uh, if delta is the deficiency is positive, it's a positive dimensional variety, and we see that uh, each hyperplane which is tangent to the second variety at z 
is tangent uh, uh, along this entry locus and uh, tangent to x. And of course, uh, it tangent to sk uh, along many uh, something multidimensional because if we have k plus one points in this uh, uh, and, uh, which contain z, uh, then it's tangent along the linear span to this variety and to linear spans of all uh, collections such that uh, z is contained in this linear space. And I must say that this is a, a, a very unusual property because there are many varieties to which uh, which do not have this property. Let me explain. If we take arbitrary variety X and we consider uh, the hyperplanes which are tangent to this variety, uh, take any hyperplane like this, any linear space, and uh, we consider the locus of points x in x, such that L contains the tangent space. Uh, at some point. So this is called the tangency locus of L. Uh, of course, uh, if we take any hy hyperplane which is tangent, then this tangency locus I is non-empty. Non but we can ask what is its dimension. And in our case, we know that if L is tangent to the second variety, then uh, we know already that we have this inequality because uh, Excel contains the entry locus. We have just proved it. Uh, at, at z, uh, and so we have this inequality. And if this second deficiency is positive, this is a non-trivial property because I give you an example or an exercise. Suppose here that x is a complete intersection. What does it mean? It means that uh, it is, uh, we assume that x is smooth. Uh, it means that uh, we have the following. x is the intersection of this number, the codimension of uh, uh, hypersurfaces. Uh, as a scheme, scheme theoretically, uh, then for each L, XL is finite. Uh, again, as a scheme, a zero dimensional. This is an easy exercise, and this shows that. Uh, 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 this property with positive delta is uh, non-evident at all. And what is the explanation? Uh, the explanation uh, is that uh, the deficiencies of complete intersections are all zero. Corollary. Particularly easy to see this is for non-singular hypersurfaces. This is an easy exercise and a useful one. Just shows that any you take you have a, a non-singular hypersurface, you take any tangent space to it. It a priori it can be uh, tangent somewhere else, but uh, if it is non-singular, this doesn't happen. 
For example, if you take a conic hypersurface, a co which is a cone, then the tendency is along the line generators of this cone. But then we have a singular vertex. If it is non-singular, this doesn't happen. Uh, maybe, well, I'll, I'll explain this in the case of hypersurfaces. Suppose that your hypersurface is defined by equation f equal to zero. Then the tangent hypersurface at x is given, as you certainly know, by the co coordinates which have this form. Because these are the equations of the tangent space, the tangent hypersurface in this case. The tangent hyperplane in this case. And you wish, uh, and now if you consider the map of x to, do, to the li dual linear space defined by this, which means uh, that the co coordinate uh, lies like this. Uh, you know that uh, being non-singular means they do not vanish simultaneously, these partial derivatives. And there you have this map, uh, which is everywhere regular, uh, everywhere defined. And then this map, uh, you want to show that this map is finite. Because being finite means that all the fibers are finite. And the fibers of this map, if you have some hyperplane here, which we note alpha, then the inverse image of alpha under this map is precisely what I defined here, where H alpha is the hyperplane corresponding to alpha. And we wish to show that the set is finite. But this is well known because uh, this is a composition of the Veronese map and the projection. And the projection, outer projection, is always a finite man map. Uh, I think that it is proved in the basic course of algebra, uh, with, uh, where you consider integral domains or algebraic geometry. So in this case, we proved it. And this holds for all complete intersections. And uh, so for all complete intersections, all uh, second deficiencies are zero. But if they are not zero, we have some interesting geometric properties. Let me give uh, another example of this uh, phenomena. Uh, last time, I mentioned the warring problem, functional warring problem. Oh, so, or maybe it's better to call it weak wiring problem for forms. And uh, this question was as follows. Take a general form of degree D of these variables. Form mean, uh, means uh, homogeneous polynomial, nothing more. Uh, and the problem is find the minimal number k such that F can be represented in this form. Uh, so this form, uh, this equation is studied for integers, as you know, in the number theory. It's an important question. But here it's a, a similar question for forms. Which form of degree? Uh, it always can be represented, of course. But how many uh, forms do you need here? Find k. And in our language, I just uh, repeat it to get you accustomed to our language. Uh, how can it be formulated in terms of order? I recall that this number, the order of the variety x, 
In our terminology, is K1 plus 1. So, for example, uh, in the Segre case, we get the uh, usual definition of order of matrix, where K1 is the smallest uh, uh, number when the second variety is equal to the ambient space. And 1 here uh, corresponds to the fact that joins and uh, second varieties have different notations. So, in our uh, definition, uh, this means find, we consider uh, this Veronese, Veronese embedding by all monomials of degree d of the linear space Pn. Uh, in, it carries Pn into this linear space, as you all know. In other words, we consider the embedding given by this shift, structure shift uh, twisted by D. And this gives you this embedding. Uh, and now uh, find the order equivalently, find the order of because uh, this Veronese variety precisely corresponds to uh, the powers of a linear form. Its second variety corresponds to the sum of two such uh, uh, powers of linear forms and so on. And so uh, the question is to find the order. Uh, and it turned out to be a difficult question, but I uh, want to use Terracini uh, uh, lemma to reinterpret this, uh, to put it uh, in a different way, uh, which is also very easy. Uh, so we consider a different problem. Uh, take k points, general points, in Pn, uh, in Pn, uh, yes, and uh, when there exists a hypersurface of degree d singular which has singularities at these points It's a uh, natural question because uh, we can uh, find uh, easily a hypersurface which is singular at one point, take a cone at two points, but when you have many points and the general position, it becomes more and more difficult. And the question is how many points you can uh, assign as singularities for a form. And the Terracini lemma uh, tells us that these two questions are equivalent, the varying problem and this, because uh, what, is, uh, what does it mean that a hypersurface is singular at some point? What is hypersurface? A hypersurface is just a hyperplane section of this, because it's just a combination of monomials. What does it mean that it is singular? It means that the corresponding hyperplane is tangent at some point corresponding to this. And so we have an equivalence between these uh, two questions. And it was this question in this form which was so solved. And uh, there is an expected number, uh, k, which is the answer here and here, which corresponds to the second uh, uh, varieties having the maximal possible dimension. I wrote this formula uh, last time. And uh, the answer is this expected answer, expect in the four cases, and the case for exceptional cases, I think. 
I will not list it. Uh, they have uh, involved degrees uh, in dim dimension 4 uh, and 3. And uh, each of them has its own history. One is uh, connected with the name of Klops. Uh, another one, uh, the recent one, is connected with the name of Mukai. Uh, but uh, the most, only one series is always exceptional. It's uh, the case D equal to 2, an arbitrary. And there, as I explained last time, and as you know from uh, the student years, uh, it's absolutely exceptional because it says that any quadratic form can be represented as a sum of at most, uh, in our notation here, uh, n plus 1 forms. Uh, n, n plus 1 squares. You all know this. Uh, and uh, this is much less, much less, uh, than expected by the general formula. And this means that this quadratic case is really exceptional. Okay, so uh, I uh, devote some more words about uh, these deficiencies in general. And then I'll pass to uh, the invariants which I am going to introduce. So what do we know, uh, what w can we say in general? First of all, uh, this uh, Deficiencies are monotonous. So we have uh, up to K1. <coughs> uh, and this is very clear because we know that uh, delta K, delta I, is equal to uh, the dimension of uh, this entry locus. And I already draw the picture. Suppose we have uh, a general point U and it lies on um, such a line where uh, by definition and now uh, this is uh, the entry locus for V and of course, all points here uh, are contained in the uh, entry locus for x. Because uh, if you have some representation like this, then uh, you have also this representation. And this means inclusion. Uh, so, uh, since they contain uh, the preceding entry lo loci, uh, we have uh, monotonicity. But this monotonicity in general need not be strict. Uh, what are other properties? Uh, we can, uh, we know Uh, this formula which I already written and from this it's an arithmetical exercise it follows that we can a different representation for SK which I think I also wrote last time at least partially can also be written like this. Uh, 
And in particular, for k equal to uh, k1, you get a formula for the ambient sp for the dimension of the ambient space. So for k equal to one, s k is equal to n, and so you get this useful formula. And finally, uh, uh, we can uh, say immediately that uh, for k less than k1, uh, one has delta k is less than n. And for uh, k1, delta k1 is equal to n if and only if s k1 minus 1 is equal to uh, n minus 1. Why is this? Uh, this uh, follows uh, for, from the Terracini lemma, because we uh, know that the entry locus, uh, this, uh, take uh, this k, take a uh, general point here, and take uh, some uh, tangent hyperplane. L tangent to SK at U. Uh, then is its tangent to X along sigma, the entry locus. And if sigma the, its dimension were n, which means that sigma coincides with x. Then all tangent spaces to x will be contained, would be contained in L. And this is impossible because we know that x is non-degenerate by our assumption, and therefore uh, all tangent spaces to x cannot be contained in a hyperplane. And the second uh, assertion uh, immediately follows from this, uh, that uh, the last, the last uh, deficiency can be equal to n, if and only if the last non-trivial uh, secant variety is a hypersurface. And I draw your attention to the fact that for square matrices, for example, the last non-trivial secant variety is a hypersurface, and its equation is called determinant, as you all know. Okay, so uh, maybe I give some examples. In particular, uh, maybe we should compute uh, these deficiencies in the known cases of matrices and quadratic forms. So to give you an example, consider the case of matrices, which means that we consider Segre variety uh, and this corresponds to matrices uh, A plus 1 by B plus 1 matrices of rank 1 and we consider further its uh, second variety which corresponds to matrices of rank 2 and so on. Uh, what is the order? What is the order of x? We know the answer from linear algebra. And what are the deficiencies? Uh, consider first the second variety. Uh, take the easiest case. a equal to b equal to 1. Then you have uh, the variety which is called a quadric in P3, P1 cross P1, and the second variety is P3. And then it's easy, uh, an easy exercise that Sx is So, 
the variety X itself is covered by such quadrics. We just uh, vary uh, a line here and a line here. Take the product. The second variety, for the second variety, we can uh, choose some line here, some line here. Consider the second variety of this quadric, which is P3, and then uh, vary a line, uh, vary each line in each of the factors. And so, uh, this is a union of P3. P3 is corresponding to different uh, choices of lines here and here. And what is the entry locus of a quadric uh, in P3? The answer is obvious. If you have a quadric in P3, it's easy for me to draw a conic in P2, but the answer is the same. The entry locus of any hypersurface uh, is this hypersurface, because any point uh, lies on uh, a line joining two points. And so, uh, the second variety is uh, a, a, a union of such P3s and delta 1 is equal to 2. And the entry locus is a quadric. Uh, now, how to compute uh, compute uh, second second variety? Uh, you should take first the case A and B equal to 2. And you see easily that this is the ambient space, which is P8. And then, what is the entry locus for a general point here? Second entry locus. If you think a little bit, you'll see immediately that it is P2 cross P2 itself. And now S2 is again a union of the spaces, eight-dimensional spaces, spanned by P2 cross P2, 1 and 2, where the first is contained in PA and the second in PB. So you should, uh, the uh, recipe is as follows, you should take two planes, one in the first factor uh, and the other in the second factor, consider the linear space uh, spanned by them, and take a union over all such planes. And you get the second second variety, or the variety uh, of matrices of uh, uh, rank 3 or less. What is the entry locus? We know that the entry locus, uh, a general point U, is contained only in one such P8, and the entry locus is like this, and so on. So we, get, we see that the delta 1 is equal to 2, delta 2 is equal to 4, because this is the dimension of P2 cross P2 is 4, and so on. And finally, we see that S, if we have this inequality, we see that uh, S A uh, is equal to the ambient space, which in this case is equal, has this dimension. And so K1 is equal to A, where A is the smallest, uh, smallest uh, of the numbers A and B, and therefore the order of PA cross PB is equal to A plus 1. Therefore, you will have a rectangular matrix, a matrix of order A plus 1, because I recall you that this corresponds to matrices of this size. Then the order is A plus 1, which is uh, rather expected. And the deltas are here. Uh, 
And so what we can actually compute it is uh, what uh, maybe sometimes is computed, uh, it's a problem in linear algebra, compute the dimension of matrices of a given rank. But we, as a byproduct we got a lot of other uh, uh, results uh, concerning tangencies. Because uh, this shows how different hyperplanes uh, are tangent to this segre variety. A problem which you can study uh, in a different way, but still uh, they, are tangent, uh, they are tangent along uh, these sub-varieties. P1 cross P1, P P2 cross P2, and so on. If, uh, yes, uh, if we are interested in positive dimensional tangencies. So this is an interesting example. Uh, and uh, then uh, uh, I need to consider maybe uh, two more examples. One is the simplest and the second one is very important to us. It's the Veronese variety. <laughs> if there are questions, please uh, ask them as soon as... Uh, you have them. So the first uh, easy example is a curve. What can be deltas here? Here we have no freedom because of this uh, proposition that I proved that delta are monotonous and delta is equal to uh, n only at the last step may it's possible. So for curves, uh, we have what uh, we have uh, mm, uh, the second uh, varieties have. Uh, Expected dimensions and uh, again delta. is either 0 or 1. And this depends uh, on uh, 1 is if the dimension uh, is even or zero uh, for k equal to k1 if n is odd. So for example if you have uh, a space curve then the deficiency is zero but if you have a plane curve of course the deficiency is one because uh, the entry locus is just its curve it isn't very interesting and the second example will be basic because we will use it uh, throughout uh, what follows it's uh, the second Veronese embedding of the projective space so what are the entry loci in this case uh, and the situation here is uh, the same as here because uh, as we know that uh, the Veronese variety is just a linear section of the Segre variety. Uh, but the interpretation is maybe even more interesting. So what is delta 1? Who can tell me? So we need, what do we need to, uh, to do? We should join two points by a line and see uh, how many, uh, in how many ways this is possible. Uh, take n equal to 1, for example. What do we get? In this case, x is a conic. And so we know already that the entry locus is a conic. 
take uh, the, now take uh, this uh, the first uh, the first uh, second variety. Uh, it's covered. Covered by uh, uh, the Veronese surface is covered by conics. Each conic uh, spans a plane, and the general uh, point in the second variety uh, is contained in this in such a plane. And so the second uh, the this is a, uh, again a conic. Now consider S two. Uh, what is, uh, suppose that uh, the dimension is equal uh, to 2, we take a Veronese surface. Uh, what is S2 for the Veronese surface? S2 for the Veronese surface, you should consider all the planes spanned by triples of points of the Veronese surface, and like this you see immediately that you obtain the ambient P5. In other words, if, if you take a symmetric matrix of rank uh, 3, uh, S2 means of rank, uh, of rank uh, 3, then you uh, get all symmetric matrices of rank 3, it's a tautology. Uh, now, uh, so, uh, so here we see that delta 1 is equal to 1, because it's the dimension of a conic. So what is the interlocus for a general uh, point uh, U here? It's a Veronese surface, by the same, because again, S2 is a union of uh, obtained for a plane. Uh, but uh, an easy uh, to follow interpretation would be the following. So we have uh, this variety, we have a variety called Pn, and then we have its map, its embedding, uh, to our variety X. Uh, uh, now, uh, So, uh, now we take uh, k general points here, and uh, consider the inverse images here. So that uh, V2 of Yi is Xi. So what is the entry locus of We can uh, say, uh, say immediately that we, if we consider its inverse image, and this is an isomorphism, this is an embedding, you immediately see that this is the linear space spent by this y, which of course means that uh, the entry locus itself is just the Veronese image of this linear space. So uh, this is just a preceding variety of the same type as our variety. So uh, we know that then uh, delta k is equal to k, the order is equal to n plus 1, and we have a very easy interpretation of uh, the entry lossy. Now we are going to do, uh, what we are going to study uh, next is the uh, uh, following. We take arbitrary variety. We change notation slightly, but it will be clear. Uh, we take arbitrary variety y, non-degenerate, 
in projective space P. Not necessarily smooth, any variety. Uh, and we are going to, uh, as I explained, uh, in many cases uh, the deficiencies of Y are trivial. And also K1 is not large, because sometimes K1 uh, is equal just to 1. If the codimension is not uh, very big, then uh, the second variety coincides with the ambient space. So our invariants for Y are not so uh, interesting. But we replace it by X, which is the second Veronese embedding of Y. It lies in a huge linear space, uh, and we can si say exactly in which linear space. But we should subtract something. Can anybody uh, say what? Uh, such the image may be contained in a hyperplane. Why? When the, it happens? Number of the yes, yes. Because if X is contained in a quadric, then its Veronese image is contained in a hyperplane. And this is not so interesting to us, so we denote by E2 of X the number of quadratic equations. Or if you wish, you can say that it's uh, um, Sorry, something like this. And then uh, the image is clearly contained here and on the generator in this uh, linear space. And uh, then for this variety X, we should study our invariance delta. Uh, and we should study our uh, K1 and K1 of x, we denote it by k2 of y. So for the original variety, uh, we denote it uh, by this, because this corresponds to the second Veronese embedding. And uh, we uh, can study the entire loss and all this. And then we are likely to get interesting examples. Why? The first question is why, because we, a priori we could uh, re-embed x by v3, v4, and so on. And the answer is that uh, uh, if we replace it by something bigger than 2, then we don't get uh, interesting invariants. Because even for the Veronese variety itself, as I told you, with a very few uh, exceptions, uh, you don't get uh, the results are as expected. The uh, dimensions of the second varieties are maximal expected. And uh, so we don't get interesting deficiencies and uh, interesting numbers. But on the other hand, uh, we get interesting invariants. We are likely to get interesting invariants for V2, because the Veranaza itself has a lot of deficiencies, as I wrote. And so uh, we can hope that in this way we get interesting, uh, interesting invariants. And this is what we'll see uh, next time. So everything uh, is prepared for the introduction and study of this. Uh, I already introduced them for the study of this invariance for arbitrary varieties. And it turns out that in uh, many, most maybe interesting cases, they are non-trivial. So that's all. Thank you very much. Questions?